Both of them were fairly long projects because uh, the art department here is very uh, picky, so to speak. So there's there's a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of the art decisions pass through George, and George works hand in hand with VCJ as he has for decades now. And it was really cool for me to work with Vernon on this because he just uh, is such a talented artist, and you would think that the smallest of details could be glazed over and were not that important in making the graphic, but after being here and seeing the process, which took many months, I would say, probably closer to five or six months in the end before we finished the graphic, it was just minor color tones, changes to just the smallest of things. It was, for example, in mine, there's uh, uh, cherry blossoms that are in the graphic that, that at first, I, I didn't really feel added to the graphic, but as they were changed and the color was put in, it, it added something to the graphic. And it was something that just had not occurred to me. Um, and that's something where George and Vern have had the experience to say, you know, there's something missing. We could add another bit of flavor to this that's, that's going to make it a little bit louder. It's going to speak more. And um, seeing the back and forth between George and Vernon is awesome because they've been working so well together for so long and uh, it's it's little tiny things you would never think of the, the size of the crown you know it's the, the oh well this color is a little too copper change it a little bit more gold oh it's a little too bright now well now the the bone isn't showing as much change the color of the bone of it it's just these really small details that in the end can make a very strong graphic and the details are Limitless, it, you could keep going, I'm sure, for years if you were there. Never. Really <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I have to slap my hands and zip my lips sometimes. It's good, it's good. It's fine. We like it. We're going to run it. Yeah, we're going to run. Okay, we made it. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of have like, you know, we, when I do graphics, people have been, uh, people have given me grief for many years because I am very picky as an art director. Um, but I've learned that, you know, it, it, I've kind of learned what the market is looking for and how to make graphics that are durable and that last a long time because they're really quality graphics. And you kind of just have to get to a certain level. And once you get to that level, then it doesn't make a whole lot of difference how much you change it. But if you don't get to that level, then you have to keep working until you do. And that's what is frustrating sometimes to both the artists and everybody else in the company who goes, why isn't that graphic done? I've heard that before. <laughs> yes. Um, as far as the shapes go, with my deck, I'm a very specific type of downhill skater. Uh, though I can do ollies, though many people don't believe me, um, it's not important to me uh, to have a tail on my board because then when I'm on the racetrack, it's not applicable. It's not a part of what I'm doing when I'm going down the hill. For me, I am focused on racing. I want to have, I'm, I want to win. I don't want to have extra board. I don't need the tail when I'm on the track, so why have it on my board as, as my pro model? And uh, being that I've skated for now, I've skated downhill since, I, well, I don't know, 2003 or something like that. And then we didn't even consider that you would have an ollie in downhill. You wouldn't even consider that you would need a tail on one of these giant longboards. And so my style over these years has been sort of old school, effective as it may be. May be. I never really grew into this sort of new school, need a tail, tic-tac around, do flip tricks with your downhill board kind of thing. So when it came to my deck, I wanted to back off everything because as I saw in the industry, people were going insane with concaves. They were making these super sharp, super aggressive, super tall W concaves that were super uncomfortable for me. They, they, they didn't feel right anymore. It had become bizarre. They'd stress the wood into these twisted shapes that didn't actually need to be there. Concave was so deep that the middle of your foot wasn't even touching the board anymore. So of course, if you're trying to ride down a hill that's 10 miles long, your feet are gonna be sore. So I wanted to just kind of get it minimal. Um, and then actually I started to find that that minimal concave not only was more comfortable, it was more effective because more of my foot was actually touching the deck. Uh, but literally my small details in the W, like having a flat top, that was kind of my idea years ago. And 
it makes a lot of sense. I mean, these subtle things in a board, after you've skated for a long enough time, you feel something small. It doesn't need to be loud. And in the case of the Byron board, well, we all know Byron is phenomenal. Uh, he wanted a deck that he could take to the skate park and do grinds in the deep end if he really wanted to. And of course, to do that, you would need a tail. So the amount of prototypes necessary to create the Byron board was insane. I think they went through six or seven molds or something with tons of minor changes to each one. And to get it to where it is now, when I ride a Byron board and take an ollie on it, it's just, it doesn't feel like a giant board. It feels sort of like an overgrown street board with a sort of funny looking nose. Um, so Byron, I think, being the guy that he is, wanted a board that was more all around. And uh, luckily, George was patient enough to uh, take the time with Byron to get it just right. And that deck is, in my opinion, one of the best boards ever made for downhill. I mean, I ride mine now very frequently, and there's something about it that's just very positive. It's easy to ride, it's easy to locate yourself, concave's comfortable as well, it's not too aggressive, and it just feels natural. So, like Byron being a natural in skateboarding, I think that's what he desired from a board, a natural feeling board. Yeah, Byron's board was definitely our biggest challenge. <clears throat> the, uh, the kicktail wasn't a problem, but the wheel wells and uh, getting the fiberglass and getting the shapes of the wheel wells uh, fared in so that we could glass them was challenging for us. And combining that with the, the bumpers on the ends. It's a, as you saw today, there's a lot that goes into that board. It's not just five plies of maple with glass on it. Uh, I think there's a, you know, with the direction of downhill, if I were to think about it, there's several different directions it can go. I think that by and large, downhill as a sport is highly inaccessible. It's the, I mean, the, the kid in Kansas is going to have a very hard time becoming downhill world champ. So I think that um, for, in downhill's best interest, I think that it should make it more accessible to more people, leaning back towards free riding on standard hills. And especially, it doesn't need to be insanely fast. It's super fun to ride a carvy little skateboard down any sized hill. And I think that that should be the type of skateboarding that we try to propagate, is just going out and having fun on a hill. It doesn't need to be this insane 90 miles an hour, setting some new record every time, because I think we've pushed those limits very, very far. And there uh, are so many people who want to be involved with it, but I think the expectations are so high that you can't even very clearly see the path to get there. So at the highest level, what I think we require is different terrain. So if we had downhill skateboard parks, we could be skating on banked walls at 35, 40 miles an hour. We could be doing slides upside down, who knows. And I think that that change in the terrain would be a major update to the sport. Now, the cost of that infrastructure would be insane, so I don't see that coming anytime soon. But um, there's sort of, uh, in racing, it's becoming very difficult to win. So we're either going to need to update the way that we race, the hills that we race on. I mean, it's, we saw there was this insane race they had in China where guys were sideways for most of the track. And that's a direction that the downhill racing can go, is just basically such a technical road that you race the road before you race your competitors. So I could see that being the direction that it goes at its highest level, but I definitely hope that we can create a more welcoming atmosphere that makes anybody want to skate downhill. I mean, I, in Vancouver, was taking my board, carving down sidewalks, and I was having a blast. It doesn't need to be insane for everybody to have fun. And uh, I think there are a lot of skaters waiting in the wings just for that to be cool again. So that's what I hope we will get to. Uh, on the topic of developing era, uh, when I was quite a bit younger, I mean, we started the brand in 2009, I had tried every single other truck on the market and uh, what, I, what I had then is I had a free ride setup and I had a race setup. And I really wanted to unite them somehow because I figured 
if I could ride the exact same setup for free riding as I was for racing, then when it came to race time, I had double the time on the same setup, so I was gonna perform better. And I, after having tried all of the trucks, I found nothing that worked for both. You know, you, you had sort of this cast truck, rough, you know, 50 degree setup, and it, it was sort of janky, and it worked great for free riding. And then you had this race setup that just was locked down, didn't steer very well. Yeah, it gripped well, but it just really wasn't fun on the streets. And I wanted to develop something that I could ride and have fun on in all environments. And um, I tried my best to work with other brands. I really did. And the deals that they gave me were a joke. And I was like, you know, this is not a good deal for me. And uh, it just was kind of out of necessity that I started Air Trucks. I wanted that, that feeling. And uh, I sort of, it was simple at first. You know, the K1 was a really simple blocky truck. It wasn't really aesthetic at all. And um, it worked well though. It was, it was actually, the geometry was white, right and it steered the way that I wanted. And uh, it just, from that I kind of just thought about it. And went, well, you know, it could be lighter and it could steer more. And I thought about the properties of all the different trucks that I'd ridden and, and what would get me the property that I wanted. And it worked out again when we did the K3. And, you know, then it just sort of, I sort of had a, a, a vision of where I wanted to take the trucks, which is lightweight, simple, very few parts, effective in all terrains, and offering a huge selection of different widths and angles, which not many, not many companies were doing at the time at all. Uh, you know, you kind of had 35 or 50. Those were your choices. So uh, it worked really well and having that sort of design theory of saying lightweight, simple, effective. I mean, those are not many things to aim for. And yeah, we, we just tried to be more creative. Start working with more, you know, higher end materials, titanium, seven series materials. Uh, we were able to make our stuff lighter and stronger than anybody else's. And I think that just the important thing was that I was riding it. And you can be a manufacturer, but if you don't ride it and you don't experience it at its highest level, it's more difficult to develop things. Uh, for me, I could have said, yeah, just change this a millimeter and that a millimeter, and I got what I was looking for. And um, now here at Skate One, it just happens that I have a bigger tool chest. So now, you know, having our urethane pivot cups made here makes a huge difference and I don't know many other manufacturers that have this many tools in a tool chest so um, it's just been easy here at Skate One because well it's simple of course we're going to make your thing pivot cups that's what we do <laughs> it's you know so that that worked out really well and uh, you know there's just a more how should I say engineering culture here and that's helped with making the products better than ever I mean I really believe the K5 is a huge step up from where we were before so that's how we've been able to develop products for our trucks. <clears throat> Just to add one, one comment, um, the reason that uh, I was interested in getting together with ERA was because I recognized <clears throat> that not only was ERA the highest performing truck available in the race market, but uh, its founder was somebody who was really design oriented and was trying to make the best he possibly could, which is what we try to do here. So right away, we were on the same level and the same frequency. And I think as we, as we work together over the years, uh, we're always frustrated by not being able to go as fast as we'd like to, but um, we do understand each other really well and we're both trying to make something that's outstanding. And so that makes it easy to work with. And I think why we chose to work with each other. It's, it, it's honestly the story that I, I kind of regret most in my life, I think, because I feel so bad about doing this and I would never relive this ever again, you know. But it, it makes me laugh and it'll probably make other people laugh too. So anyway, I was trying to get down to this uh, race.